Hi, I'm Jose Lozano. At Choose New Jersey, we work to attract businesses to our state by promoting our talented workforce and world-class infrastructure for companies big and small. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank, the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Choose New Jersey. Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Community Food Bank of New Jersey. And by University Hospital, Newark, New Jersey. Promotional support provided by ROINJ. Informing and connecting businesses in New Jersey. And by New Jersey Globe. This is one on one. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got this? this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. That's a great rundown of guests you saw in the open, but we continue with great guests. I'm Steve Adubato. This is at NJTV Studio in Newark. And this is Jody Joseph Bon Jovi. Yeah. And she's the founder and president of an organization called Heartstrings, which is? A nonprofit that helps underprivileged children and adults to use music to enhance their lives. Why is so, that so important? Well, because... Um, I'm a living, breathing example of what it's done for me. I've used songwriting and singing as a way in which to vent, as a way in which to be able to express my feelings, my hurts, my joys. And um, not everybody gets that opportunity. Mm -hmm. I teach privately, and um, when I had some people go in hard times, I would just carry them and say, don't worry about paying. And I realized, what if I made this on a really big scale? And my account says, you're crazy. Well crazy I am, I said, I'm going to do this. And I met up with people that knew what they were doing. And several times I thought this is something I probably shouldn't have gotten into. But we're two years strong, and we've touched the lives of so many people through music. Mm -hmm. so. You grew up in a musical family? Yes. But I'm older than John, so. I didn't even ask you about John. <laughs> I, I wasn't kidding. going to. It's OK. So I... you, oh, you do know that guy? <laughs> yeah, first cousin. Music all around? My grandfather was a self-taught musician who never graduated. Um, I think he didn't even graduate eighth grade. And he played the accordion and every single instrument. Wow. And um, I had a lot of talent. My, my first cousin was uh, Robert Hedges uh, from Welcome Back, Cotter. My brother was married to Bob Newhart's daughter. So it's always been, like, all over around me, like, pew, 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 you know? That's so interesting. Yeah. So, so now with heartstrings. <clears throat> What do you do for these kids, and where do you do it? Because you and adults. With, and adults. Yeah. Give us an example. Well, um, one of the places that we visit is New Hope at Discovery, and that's in Marlboro. That was our, I guess, our pilot. And um, it was very scary going in because these, you know, you're not going into something that is nice and cushy. You're going into broken, a broken environment. You know, these kids are there. A lot of them don't want to be there. Um, the sad part is uh, I bought music therapy and for songwriting, and one of the girls I was working with, you know, I mean, the sadness of how she got the drugs with the story behind it was just devastating. This is a drug rehab? And sort of? alcohol and, I guess, self-abuse. Um, some of them are, you know, they have to go there because the state puts them there. Other where times they volunteer. Where does music well, fit into that? Well, first of all, they have to have outlets. How do you, you know, what do you do with that? So we bought in a songwriting program, guitar, piano, and also beats, which is where they can sure. uh, write to uh, rap. And um, I think the best thing that I've ever heard is that we go there on Tuesdays. They said that Tuesdays are their favorite day. It's that's what they look forward to the most. What does that do for you? I can't leave there without crying. I just am so uplifted by what it's doing. Um, we just had a little mini concert there last week, and um, it's just, it's amazing. The power of music and healing is just phenomenal. And, um, you know, I'm always on the other side of it a lot, where I have to 
my begathons, my concerts. We were talking you know. about raising money yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. You don't love that part, but you love no. what you do, so therefore, no money, no mission, you raise the money. Yeah, and I, I have an amazing uh, board right now, and my, my VP is here with me, Diana Welch. She's amazing. Everybody that is part of it is really helpful. And they're, 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 I'm, I'm only one part of I'm one spoke in the wheel. What impact do you think it has on these kids? I know all the people who are connected to it. Um, well, you know, we, we also work with adults, and um, I think that when I'm with Dawn and uh, she comes to the house for private training, she uh, was in 180 uh, Turning Lives Around which is a safe house. And um, she now is through Amanda's easel, and that program is allowing her to come to me and my team one-on-one. -on -one. Mm. And she says stuff like, "You." she starts to cry. Like, you have no idea what this has done for me. It gives them purpose, it gives them outlets, and it gives them confidence that they have something that is their own, their very, very own. So, when, you know, Trudy, when you were a little kid, you said you, you think you wrote your first song at 11 to your parents about smoking. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was communicating right then, you it, know, because you can't go to a parent and say, quit smoking, so I wrote them a song. Well, you could, but they the said, song... They said, how cute, it, you know? It, it, well, here's what I'm trying to get at. Has music been largely your way of communicating with the world from as far back as you can remember? Largely. I, I Not exclusively. I have to honestly tell you, if I'm upset, like, or angry or excited, I can't help myself. I just go right, sit down with a guitar in my hands and I start writing. It's just... Is it mostly guitar for you? Uh, yeah, mostly. But sometimes I'll just sit there and start singing a melody or I'll start writing. You know, I, it, it, I don't know, the chicken or the egg. It just all happens Doesn't sometimes matter. at once. It's just no, music. It just has to come out. What's the future of Heartstrings? Oh, I hope it grows into its own entity as far as a building that we have, and I can reach so many, many, many more. We're in five facilities. And by the way, speaking of fundraising, you're funded by one of the financial institutions we know well, yes. investors. Yes, they are. I'm here today because of the connection, so they're helping us, and we're really, really happy about that. Yeah, they also help our friends at the Montclair Film Festival as well. They're, they're very much into uh, the arts. By the Wonderful way, people. Uh, corporate and philanthropic foundation support is what keeps us going. It's also what keeps your nonprofit, Heartstrings, going. I know Heartstrings was, uh, the website was up during this segment. Jared, I want to wish you all the best. Continue to make a difference that you're making every Thank day. Thank you. I appreciate Very that. Very well done. Thank okay. you. Okay. I'm Steve Arabato. This is One on One, and we'll be right back after this. To watch more One on One with Steve Arabato, find us online and follow us on social media. There he is on camera. Greg Carenda, he's the head coach of Fairleigh Dickens University men's basketball team, and they are called the what? The Knights. The Knights. The Knights. The, the, what do you look, look at you pointing over here? By the way, here it is. It's FDU, <laughs> and because this is PBS, no disrespect. You got to put it We're on. It's okay. okay. Patty, could you take this? We cannot plug. We well, don't we, plug. We got, the, we got the plug in, but that's it. We now, are the FDU Knights in, in Hackensack and Teaneck campus. You took over 2013. Yes, I did. And you guys went to the dance. The big dance yes. of 64 in when? 2016 was the first time. It was my third year. We had the third youngest team in America, and, and Steve, it kind of came out of nowhere. The previous year, we lost 15 straight basketball games. 15. Um, but we had good players, good young kids. We were changing the culture, um, and then we won it. And we went to Dayton, Ohio, uh, and played Florida Gulf Coast, and it didn't go well. And we lost our first round, and our goal was to get back. And we just got back in 2019, and we got to Dayton and won a game. And it was his first uh, victory in the school's history in the NCAA tournament. And, and here I sit, a very lucky, lucky man, a lucky coach. For those who have never experienced the NCAA tournament, other than being fans. And, yes. Uh, uh, we're at Seton Hall fans. I just need to disclose that. True. I know you know that. And you True. have a connection to Seton Hall? Yeah, I was an assistant there for, for three years. To the great George Blaney. The, 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 the legendary George Blaney. And I hired uh, Grant Bill Meyer, who's the assistant now for Kevin. That's right. And Bruce Hamburger is my associate head coach. So there's, you got there's a some lineage. There. So here's the thing. For those yes. of us who don't really know, how exciting is it being at the Yes. Dance? It's, it's more than you think. It is? It's not? No, it's it, more. It's more than what you think it's it is. It's more. It's more. Because? Uh, because you work your whole life 
and, and for that moment, and they talk about the one shining moment, and it's not only the team that wins it, it's for every player that participates and every fan that follows and every coach that dreams. Uh, and you just can't sleep. You can't because you're in an elite group and uh, it's just very exciting. It's rewarding. It's exciting. It's, it's Let's so. Let's put perspective. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, 64 yeah. teams. How many teams in the country play? Well, it's actually 64 60 teams plus the f first four yes. that are in. So it's 68. 68. Go ahead. And there's just about 366. So, yeah, so it's, it's, it's not, not easy. They don't hand it to you. No. That's for sure. And especially <clears throat> when I took over the program at Fairleigh Dickinson, uh, it wasn't in the best stead. And um, it's work. And it's the, the time that you put in and, and the, the greatest thing, Steve, to be honest with you, that makes it euphoric for a coach is seeing the players enjoy it. Because these kids, man, I've got the greatest kids in the world and they are so deserving. They work so hard. And when they're happy and their families are happy and our fans and our president, our athletic director, it's a team. And uh, we, we had a great team this year and we have a great program uh, and we have success uh, looking forward as well I hope I'm a student of leadership yes sports and leadership yes is oh, you, you got to walk the walk and, uh, you know you have to be in there with these guys and they have to believe and I've co I played high school basketball uh, at St. Peter's prep I know you're a Seton Hall prep we have a lot of like <laughs> connections a lot of connections a little a rivalry, some, some yeah. rivalries too I was but an SS Catholic guy back in the day. Our school's closed now. How yes. good was SS Catholic in a parochial A? Oh, my God. Real, How good? Very Tremendous. good. Very good. But leadership is, is doing, it's being, it's, and it's a connection. Now you need to have a connection with your players. When I grew up, my coaches hollered at us and really? screamed at us. Really? I can't relate. <laughs> And now you have to control and you have to. Yes, you do. But it you has to be. You can't go old school on these no, kids. No, But it has to be real. Look at your hugging kids right there. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's Nadi Basiri. And, and he played two minutes in, in the NCAA tournament game. And, and he just got offered a, a big time business job wow. just before we, this taping I found out. So it's, it's way more than uh, basketball. It's, it's life. And, there, and when you have a connection with people. The synergy between my, myself and my players and my staff and our alums and the university, and it capsulizes in the tournament, but it's, it, it, it lasts forever. We have a player that just got um, signed for the Utah Jazz to play in their summer league. He came to me uh, as a 17-year-old young man that had no scholarships and averaged four points uh, a game as a freshman, and now he's with the Utah Jazz, Darnell Edge. What's that do for you? So, it, 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 it says what we're doing the right things. I have good assistants. We, we, we recruit the right players. And we do it the right way. And that's why, you know, sometimes people watch college basketball and, and we don't have the greatest light right now as basketball coaches because things have Stuff transpired. Happens. And ethics matter. But that, but and how you play the game matters. And some of your colleagues don't play the game the right way. I really think it's a small, minute group. I really do. The coaches that... I see on the road and that I've worked with and that I've hired, we do it the old-fashioned way. We just go out and we get good players. Uh, a we, lot of them from New Jersey? Most of, most of them. I hired Dwayne Lee from St. Anthony's and Bruce from um, Seton Hall and this New Jersey. Mike Fratello has been in our gym. Uh, you know, Michael Korn lives up the street. Kerry Kittles. Oh, cool. wait, wait. Who played... Michael Korn, I'll tell you what, you're bringing me back. Yes. These are guys who play well, from old. I'm yeah, old. In Jersey City days. Yes. Right? Yes. They played at Hudson Catholic. Yes. I remember these guys. Yeah, you're good. So how about this? April 2018, you're at the Final Four of San Antonio, Texas. What happens? Whew, wow. Uh, I'm walking with my son, who we, I've taken him now for a long time, over a decade, and I couldn't walk any longer. My leg sw was swollen, had pain. And I tried to continue to walk on the river walk, and uh, I couldn't do it. And my wife wanted to go to the hospital, and I said, let me just elevate it, and, you know, in the morning, we'll figure it out. In the morning, it was bigger. Um, and uh, we were lucky to go to uh, Methodist uh, Metropolitan Hospital, where Greg Silas, the CEO and of the hospital, came and visited me every day. But I had two major blood clots, one on my thigh and one on my abdomen, um, and they couldn't put a stent above it to keep it from going to my lungs or my heart or my brain, and it was scary. Do you know if you were going to live or die? 
I didn't want to die in Texas. <laughs> I've told this to people before. Oh, I wanted that. to get. Uh, We're not seeing in Texas, but don't say that. I, wa- no, I love Texas. I love it, but I wanted to get. I, f- I wasn't sure. I, when, and when you're laying there and you have 104.5 fever, and the one time that I was worried was my blood pressure dropped really low. And I thought it was something was wrong with the machine. And the, she said, well, how do you feel, the nurse? And I'm, she said, sit up a little bit. And I tried to sit up. And if I was standing up, I would have fell down. So I was, uh, but I got tremendous care um, from all, from coaches, from my staff, but from my players. But my wife and my son were there behind. They, how long was that rehab? Me. Several months? It was a six-month rehab. And oh, still boy. to this day, I'm still, you know, we're, you have to, you know, you have to work at it. Does the, let me ask you this: that health scare like that, winning that game in a yeah, tournament, right? A year later, right? No, it's well, no. I know. I was just. The, the, I'll never forget, Steve. The Michigan Villanova championship game was on in my room. That's when I was in intensive care, and I couldn't watch it. So if you think back, I couldn't even watch a game, and then to the next year to win a game in the tournament that I couldn't watch, there's, there's a, a guardian angel uh, looking over me. And my mother, it was my best friend, uh, my best friend. And I was quoted as, uh, in, in, in my commencement address as saying her famous words were, always ring the doorbell with your elbows. Just and that's F- why I brought at, you a hat. At FDU hat. you did that. I'm sorry. At I stepped FDU. On that. That's OK. What'd you say again? Always ring the doorbell with your elbows. So when I came here today, I brought you that hat. And I, I when I go to the tournament, I've, you've got to bring something in life. There are too many, there are too many takers and not enough givers. And my mother was a giver, and I try to just be a little bit like her and my dad. And, and I think it rubs off on my players. Greg Horenda is the head coach at Fairleigh Dickinson University's men's basketball program. Number one, good health. Number two, good luck next year. Yes. We're still going to be rooting for the Pirates. I know, man. That's all right. I appreciate it. Steve, thanks for Thank having me. Thank you, my friend. Pleasure. All the best. Pleasure. Thank this you. is Steve Arabato. That is Greg Herenda. This is One on One. Be right back. To watch more One on One with Steve Arabato, find us online and follow us on social media. Hi, Steve Arabato on location. Normally you see us in the studio, but we are, in fact, here in Vermont for a very special day. This is part of our Right From The Start NJ initiative, which looks at the challenges uh, facing our infants and toddlers and those who care for them. This is an event sponsored by the Terrell Fund. The Terrell Fund, um, a day for children, all about children. And the theme is the importance of love in early childhood. We're honored to be joined by a whole group of people here in Vermont. And first off, we're uh, talking to the Lieutenant Governor of the great state of Vermont, David Zuckerman. David, good to see you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. You're a farmer by background. It's true. Yeah, it's still true. have a little grease on my hands. Yeah, no, no Jersey <laughs> tomato jokes, okay? No, no, you grow fine tomatoes. Ours are just a hair better. I knew that was coming. <laughs> uh, listen, by the way, you can hear the folks around us. There, uh, there's a break going on right now. Important conversations about early childhood education, about child care. Let me ask you, you, when you spoke to this group earlier, uh, folks who are advocates, who are very involved and committed to child care, sure. your main message to them was, is? Well, I think a large part of it was advocacy to get the legislature to go farther, to uh, get more financial support to both the centers, uh, the home care facilities, and the workers so that we have less turnover and people can stay in that profession instead of getting squeezed out financially, and really encouraging folks to contact their legislators. Vermont's a small state. Tell so, folks, we have 8 million people in New Jersey, so give sure. people context. Well, Vermont's about 630, 640,000 people. So each legislator only represents about five to 10,000 people. If it's a two-seat district, it's 10,000. So encouraging folks to contact their legislators, even the ones that they think are good on the issues, and give them that boost of support when those legislators have to push a little farther, mm-hmm. particularly in a topic no one ever wants to talk about, which is raising revenue at the state level. So raising can, taxes. Raising taxes so that we can actually fund this important investment in our kids. Because fundamentally, uh, as the folks in that other room know very well, that zero to five is when 90% of your development happens. Mm -hmm. And so if we invest in quality, affordable, and available childcare, we're investing in Vermont's future 
many, many times over. You know, the other thing is you may say, why Vermont? Vermont is actually recognized by many in the child care community as a model for the nation. What you did not get a chance to talk about up there, and I wanted to really ask you when I was, sure. I've been moderating this, this conversation today, what is the role in your view, Lieutenant Governor, of the federal government mm -hmm. when it comes to the question of promoting child care, providing federal dollars for quality child care, et cetera? Go ahead. Well, I think in this day and age, the role is beyond the federal dollars. It's also about leadership, about thinking beyond yourself. What does that mean? Um, what that so means- So excuse me for interrupting. My kids are good, I'm good, we've had great child care. Not my problem, you say. Right. Well, let's look at the Terrell Fund. Here's a gentleman who came up, uh, worked hard to make a good living, uh, even back in the 30s and 40s when the marginal tax rates on the wealthy were 60 and 70%. Not only did they pay their taxes to make society better, but then he dedicated, and his wife Margaret, huge sums of money to a fund to support children. Those children were not his children. Mm -hmm. Those were other people. And the thought of thinking beyond yourself, beyond thinking that uh, your success is solely due to your own action, certainly I believe in, in the idea that you can succeed and make yourself better than you would have been if you don't try mm -hmm. hard and you don't work hard. But at the same time, recognizing that everybody comes from very different circumstances and it's not fair to assume that someone that comes from a more challenged economic household or a split family household or various other early childhood challenges, adverse uh, aces, adverse childhood, aces, adverse adverse childhood, childhood experiences. experiences. By the way, while the Senate government's talking, sorry if you interrupt me, go on our website, you'll see it on the screen right now, steveoutabotter.org, put in aces. We've done a whole series of interviews with folks about these adverse childhood experiences, that's right. including national experts on it. Well, People may not know the acronym, that's right. but it's real. It's very real. There's a lot of research and studies that show uh, that the challenges for folks to overcome some of those. Many do, but some don't. And the more we can nurture those kids from zero to five and think about others, the more we're actually helping ourselves as well. Both in tangible ways, those folks are more likely to be, quote, productive members of society, uh, good employees, uh, potentially entrepreneurs in the future, but also selfishly, if they don't end up going down a, a less uh, desirable track, uh, which might cost us Who in pays? incarceration or others. We pay. we pay. And so you can either do it from a selfish perspective or you can do it from a holistic perspective. And I think in our souls, we're actually holistic beings. Uh, and at the national level, because that was the, the, the nexus of your question, was what could be done at the national level? One, leaders could be talking more about our community and how we pay it forward to all of our community, how fortunate we are in this country as a whole, as the leading country of the world, as the wealthiest country in the world, that we ought to be um, uh, sharing that wealth to make our own society better as well as the world. But then fundamentally at the budget level, instead of cutting budgets for investment in childcare and in education and in our workers and our workforce, uh, we should be adding to that. It could be through universal health care, so that those low-wage workers have health care and don't have to leave the profession because they don't have health care. And it could be investing in subsidizing their education so they can get trained more and help those small health care centers or even home health care uh, providers. Uh, more opportunities to learn how to really engage those children and give them more. There's a, there's a million ways, but it takes leadership. The theme today is all about love. Um, the importance of love in early childhood a lot of this is about Fred Rogers. Yes. There's a documentary about Fred Rogers. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's incredible. Remember, Fred Rogers in 1968, PBS, groundbreaking children's programming, influenced so many of us, helped form who we have become. Helped me. Helped you, helped me. But here's the thing. This theme of love, which is a theme of this event today, do you think most political figures respond to a message of love and its connection to helping our children, David? Uh, I think they do. Uh, I think humans do. I think in some ways in our society, we've moved away from the ability to talk about things like love, compassion, um, something other than sort of aggression and battle. Uh, and we need to talk about it more. Uh, we all benefit when we are more compassionate for the circumstances others are in. Uh, the whole concept of paying it forward is a concept that you know, more and more people are embracing. Uh, and we've had decades, most of my life, where money has been the uh, defining token of success. Uh, 
Uh, and I think what we're starting to see, maybe, is a pendulum back towards community being a pendulum of success, a, a moniker of success. That love and what we do for each other is actually who we are in our souls. One of the speakers uh, pointed out that there was a quote on a wall saying, you know, when you die, and um, my mom passed away at the beginning of this year, so it's, it's sorry. quite close to me at the moment, uh, you don't take the money with you, you don't take the houses with you, uh, you don't take the, you know, anything as a possession with you. Um, what you have taken with you is the memories that those who you leave behind have. And those memories and those values are so much more than money. They are that love, they are that compassion. David Zuckerman is Lieutenant Governor in Vermont. I want to thank you for joining us on public broadcasting, thank Fios you. and other platforms that you see us on. All the best, we appreciate well, it. Thanks for the work you do, it's great to see you. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 30 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Investors Bank, the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Choose New Jersey, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, Community Food Bank of New Jersey, and by University Hospital, Newark, New Jersey. Promotional support provided by ROINJ and by New Jersey Globe. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Look around. One in seven New Jersey children goes hungry every day. Hunger is everywhere right here where we live, and it doesn't look like you think. Help the Community Food Bank of New Jersey feed our hungry neighbors. Do you make decisions, do I eat or do I get my medicine? Do I eat? or do I pay my rent? And you got people making decisions like this each and every day, juggling their finances. How are they gonna pay a bill here? Do I pay my car note or do I eat?